Oh, that's right. Happy Bastille Day. Um, so uh, there's a laser pointer here. OK, so thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for showing up. Um, at this, this is a relatively um, nice weather time in Seattle, so no rain. That's good. Um, I'm going to talk about neutron star observations and how we can connect them to the nuclear nuclear interaction and gravitational waves. I have to um, thank, I have many excellent collaborators, at least for the particular work, the works that I will describe today. I mentioned Ed Brown, Farouk Fotoyev, uh, Stefano Gondolfi will be here later this week, I believe. Jim Latimer is also here somewhere. Um, William Newton and, of course, Madhapa Prakash. Um, so, uh, we went to LIGO yesterday. Um, I learned a couple things. This is actually says LIGO, you can't see, but this um, it's, it was an excellent trip. LIGO is doing very exciting physics. I'm, and that's one of the things I learned. The other thing is that I'm very thankful for air conditioning because right now it's extremely hot. Um, but Mike Landry here gave a, a very excellent tour of LIGO. This is actually the X arm. Uh, and it goes out four kilometers that way. And of course, then here's um, Niels and I, we're smiling because uh, we like LIGO. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you want them to operate? Yeah, scalpel. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about neutron star masses and radii in the equation of state. And then I want to um, talk about tidal deformabilities. Uh, so I believe we can. Um, at least think about trying to predict tidal deformabilities. Uh, and, and of course, we want to also measure them in LIGO. Um, uh, mentioned briefly pulsar glitches and moments of inertia, just as another example of, of the kinds of physics that we, we might be able to probe, not only in mass radius observations, but also in LIGO. And um, then uh, some talk briefly at the neutron drip line at the end. Uh, I believe there was some discussion uh, last week or the week before on that. So Sanjay asked me to mention that briefly. Um, so just to sort of talk about the background, I mean, there are really some fundamental questions in nuclear physics and astrophysics that are connected to neutron star masses and radii, the equation of state, and, and LIGO. And so, you know, what is, what's happening at, at high densities and low, low temperatures inside neutron stars? This is the, the so-called QCD phase diagram. And so we, you know, is there, is there a really a transition to quark matter, in, a deconfined quark matter in the center of the neutron stars? Um, and then what is, what's the nature of the nuclear nuclear interaction? How do nucleons interact? And the origin of the elements also will, will play a role um, either, especially maybe next week, if not this week. So, um, and then of course, astrophysical questions, how do neutron stars merge? Um, how do mergers gener generate gravitational waves? What is the neutron star initial mass function? That's uh, really um, one of my favorite questions. So. Um, I, I think we, have, we can do exciting physics. So just, um, just so to sort of uh, introduce the connection between masses and radii in the equation of state briefly, so neutron stars to a good approximation lie um, on one uh, universal mass versus radius curve. So all the neutron stars in the universe in principle lie on this curve and then all, our job is just to figure out what it is. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this curve and the equation of state of of dense matter from QCD. And so this is pressure and energy density. Um, and so we can exploit this correspondence. Um, so there's been some very accurate mass measurements. There's a measurement of two solar mass neutron star, which is, of course is important because it's just a horizontal line and the, the curve must go high enough to cross the line. Um, but then also radius observations are really important. Um, they're they're in, in, some in many ways more constraining than, than mass measurements. So um, I would say that as of about 2007, um, 8 to 15 kilometers might be an, uh, uh, an appropriate range for neutron star radii. And I claim now that 10 to 13 kilometers is much more appropriate uh, considering uh, recent neutron star mass and radius observations, um, barring some systematic uncertainties, which of course will play a role. Um, so I want to talk about fitting that. The idea, of course, is that if you have little observations, little blobs in this plane, you can just sort of connect the dots. And that's the mass versus radius curve. You can use this correspondence to determine the equation of state, learn something about nuclear physics. Um, and so let's talk. Um, it's useful to remind you guys of what you already know. Um, so this is a chi-squared fit. This is sort of a generic plot I stole from the internet. But the idea is you have you know, data with sort of one-dimensional uncertainties, and then you have some function, and you do a fit, and you determine the parameters, and then you're done. What's the plotted, what's this plot in the left um, it's just a, supposed to be a, a, an example of a generic chi-squared fit. I, it's actually E. coli or something. I don't know. I just stole it from the internet. <laughs> 
Um, so, but this is actually what our data looks like. Our data does not look like this. It is, so it has, the point of this is that it has uncertainties in both, if you like the X and Y directions, the mass and the radius both have significant uncertainties. So if you can like, if you, if you like the yellow region here, you see it has this large yellow region here and you have to fit a curve through this data. And so, so it's challenging, uh, it's a challenging problem in fact, so it's not because of the uncertainties in the x-axis, you can think of it not as chi-squared fitting, but of something more complicated, which is called Deming regression. Deming regression actually does not have um, any sort of solution. Uh, it may have multiple solutions, it may have no solution. And that's because, um, in part because of the uncertainties and then to add more complications, the mass radius curve, we call it a curve for a very good reason. It's not a function. It will fail the, the horizontal or vertical line test. So this is a, a paper by um, Mark Alford and, and Prakash and Sophia Hahn. And you see that, so here you see an example of a mass, mass radius curve. So it's basically uh, the, the the, so both this red solid curve and this green solid curve. So you can imagine a horizontal line going through and it crosses the curve twice. Same for the horizontal, for the vertical line test. So it's complicated to figure out how to match these sorts of curves to this sort of crappy data. And so um, I choose Bayesian analysis to do this, but this is just to demonstrate that it's something um, a little bit more complicated involved than a naive chi-squared fit. Um, but just like, just like a traditional chi-squared fit, one of the best ways to do this, since we have a curve with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, is to do a parameterization. We want to parameterize, if you like, the equation of state. Um, and then we can use that parameterization to determine the equation of state, compute the mass versus radius curve, and then compare it in some way to the data. So this is just a plot. Um, I am showing of the, the equation of state. This is just the energy as a function of the number of baryons um, per unit volume of just pure neutron matter. So this is, this is something close to what you see in neutron stars. And then nuclear matter. This is just equal numbers of neutrons and protons in a box. And then what is the equation of state? Um, so you can parameterize this equation of state. Um, this is this, these sort of two curves together, let's focus on the bottom curve first. You have the binding energy, which is just actually the, the distance of this minimum from zero, and n naught is the location of this minimum, the saturation density, compressibility k is just the curvature here. And so these are fundamental parameters, if you like, in the equation of state of nuclear matter. And then the symmetry energy is just the difference between neutron matter and nuclear matter. I've defined it here as this function s. And so the real relevant parameters are the value of the symmetry energy, just this distant difference here at the saturation density, and then this funny logarithmic derivative here, which we call L, if you like the density dependence or the slope of the symmetry energy. So it tells you how, how, quickly, how quickly this neutron matter is increasing versus nuclear matter as a function of density. So this is, uh, this is how matter looks like, what matter looks like in a neutron star at about three times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed. It looks much like neutron matter with a little bit of protons. So we know that as we go outwards in the neutron star, we get to the crust. Um, and so that, it turns out the crust will not be, is, is a solid lattice. It has real nuclei in it, but it's not actually particularly relevant, at least for masses and radii, which I'll talk about. Um, so that's at low densities. And then we have this sort of nucleonic matter um, near three times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed. And as, as we go higher in density, then basically we don't know what's going on. It could be nucleons, it could be Bose condensates, deconfined quark matter, hyperons of all sorts. And so the, the particular approach we take into to parameterizing the equation of state is to use poly, is for example, one way is to use polytropes. So we just have generic relations like this, um, just a power law. And so the idea is at low density, we have a crust. We convert at some transition density to um, nucleonic matter, um, just nuclear matter here, or, or nearly pure neutron matter at the saturation density, and then to a polytrope at some moderate densities, and then another polytrope at higher densities. And so this is just one particular way of constructing the equation of state. Of if you like, it's just a way of parameterizing our ignorance of what's really going on in the center of the neutron star. You can also just use lines. You can approximate any function by a, almost by a piecewise mute. I don't know what that means, but I'm not going to stop talking. So, uh, 
<laughs> quick, quick before you. Okay, so you can also just use lines um, in, in addition to this um, at high density. And it turns out that these two different parameterizations tend to, tend to favor or disfavor phase transitions at some level. But the important thing is that you want to try different things. You want to try different models, and that's one of the things I want to emphasize. So um, this is where this is where sort of you think of the nuclear physics of happening, the physics of neutrons and protons, and the physics of the nucleon-nuclear interaction. And so in particular, maybe it's parameters like S and L and K that we're interested in determining, one of the things that we're interested in determining from neutron star mass and radius measurements. And I'll show how that happens. Um, in general, you can think of this maybe as an energy density functional, um, a function uh, that the energy density as a function of the neutron and proton densities. And this is a sort of standard language we think of in nuclear physics to, uh, to talk about how, uh, how the nucleon nuclear interaction works and how you can construct nuclei from that uh, interaction. Okay, uh, just, just again, some uh, related to some of the things we talked about last week, okay, we, of course, we make, we've had made a model of the equation of state. Um, sometimes our goal is to figure out which model is preferred, um, and, and I'll be able to do that with base factors. And sometimes we would like to estimate parameters. So, for example, we want to know what is the pr value of S or L or, or K. But sometimes these parameters don't necessarily have a clear physical meaning, and so maybe parameter estimation isn't as useful. Um, on the, of course, we always like to do, make predictions. We'd like to predict what is the tidal deformability of a neutron star before they actually make the measurement in LIGO. And so either in the frequentist analysis or a Bayesian approach, you can think of a prediction as just a probability distribution. What is the probability that the, the, the radius of a neutron star is 13 kilometers relative to the probability that the radius of a neutron star is 12 kilometers? And so um, in general, you can think of, you can, you can think of, say, you know, some probability distribution that looks, like, looks like this over some certain parameters, and values around a half are preferred. Um, and so you can, you can do this pr pr prediction. You can make a prediction over the parameter space, of course, because your model parameters have some uncertainty. Then your prediction also has some uncertainty. And you can, a lot of times, one talks about that uncertainty due to the parameters as a statistical uncertainty. And that, this is the uncertainty that you expect to improve with more data. And then you can talk about the, the distribution of the model space. That is, I have, different, I have these different models um, of, of high density matter. Okay, and so these, these models also imply some uncertainty, uh, and that uncertainty is, you can think of that as this systematic uncertainty. And so, so you can also think of doing this sort of probability distribution over the model space in addition on top of the parameter space. And so this is a, a figure I stole from our 2005 paper, and this is, this is a several models which predict two quantities. First, they predict the, the the, essentially the pressure of neutron star matter just below the saturation density, and then the neutron skin thickness of lead, which I won't talk about but too much, but you can imagine all of these models, if you like, they provide some sort of probability distribution for the, for the pressure of neutron, uh, neutron star matter. But you see there are, uh, there are two different models and several different parameter sets here. Um, but, it, but this, you can see that it's not clear that I've exhaustively explored the parameter space or the model space in any systematic way. What I've really done here is more like this. I've sampled the probability distribution at some particular points, not, very, not necessarily well organized over this range. So it's not at all clear that I'm really making an accurate prediction or a precise prediction. In, and so this is, this is the kind of plot which um, sometimes we're required to do it this way just because things are computationally difficult. You cannot do a neutron star merger simulation for a million different equations of state um, yet. Uh, but at the same time, this is something you should think of as possibly dangerous. So um, now I want to get to the real, uh, to the observations just briefly. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, radius measurements in quiescent low mass X-ray binaries. Basically, you can just think of this as a hot neutron star. You look at it and what do you see, the, the satellite, uh, it gets X-ray photons. You know how many photons enter your detector as a, fun your satellite as a function of time. That's the flux. 
You also know something about the color, the spectrum of photons. You have some energy information, so that tells you the temperature. If you also happen to know the distance to that neutron star, then you have the distance, and you can get our infinity. This is a, just a GR correction to the radius. So effectively, if you measure these three things, you have a radius measurement. And again, this is what the data looks like. And you see, if you put it all together, basically the, the darkest region, I've just sort of added up the colors naively, but, the, but mostly they suggest 11 kilometer radius, which is basically the answer we'll, we'll get in the end. The, that's actually the peak of the probability distribution for each of the, neutrons, each of the five neutron stars here. Um, so it's not at all clear that they lie in any sort of mass versus radius curve, which is uh, an interesting point in and of itself. Uh, I assume, Cole, you're going to talk about this in more detail tomorrow? Uh, yes, sir. OK. And you'll win. You'll probably talk about it also. OK. <laughs> can, can I have a teaser of an answer right now? Yes. A little more detail. I'm not giving up. Yeah. And oh, all, all of that combined means that you have extreme uncertainty about what the actual radius is. So uh, to my mind, I think it is actually the systematics in our modeling of the source that, that dominates. That's what I was after, yes. That, that dominates, yeah. But you also have, uh, I think, non-trivial issues like what if there's a power law component to the spectrum? So for example, these Q element speeds are supposed to have accreted at some point. Maybe they're still accreting a little bit, in which case you might have an additional spectral component not taken into account, in which case that could mess up a lot of your determinations. Um, so it, of course, Prakash has uh, introduced a very- Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, Sorry. So I know what observers do, where, where they just fit, you know, in the simplest thing that they fit, that looks good, they're, they're happy with. Yeah. Um, I assume, but they often try different things where they include a power law component to see how much it changes the results. Have they done it, and does it? Power make laws, a yeah, power laws have been included. They don't make a whole lot of difference, but that's they only add one power law at a yeah, time. At the high energy end. Yeah. That's, yeah. If there's, I don't know if there's like an embedded power law in the low energy. I don't know. You could imagine situations where. Well, I mean, it's the it, the usual fit of the power law high energy it does extend into. But it's small. Yes, you, for s some of the sources, for other sources, it's it can be clearly a problem, and those sometimes times are excluded from these types of things. But something I mean, maybe you're going to see this, Andrew, but certainly I'm going to emphasize that the challenge here is that different assumptions about, for example, the atmospheric composition, which, which you list here, you can get equally good fits. So there's not a hint from the data itself which model is necessarily the right one. To this um, so yeah, and in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later in terms of X-ray absorption uh, uncertainties in particular, which yes, which played a role. Yes, please. So are these colors representing like posterior PDFs? Uh, uh, these are you, these. Yes, if you like. So uh, if you like, what happens is they measure fluxes and temperatures. There's some Monte Carlo to get a posterior for the masses and radius. And then I do an additional Monte Carlo on top of that in order to get the equation of state. The nice thing is that I mean, all of these are done for different sources, but by the same team. So the flash as even for all of them are the same? Uh, apples to apples? This, for these five objects, yes. Um, there are some mass and radius observations, which I will use, which come from different kinds of observations, which have different priors. And so that, that detail, I, I, wasn't, I won't talk about too much, but we can talk about it later. So how That's serious important. should we take those peaks, the, for three of them, the mass is below 
one sort of aspect there is a large error bar. Yeah, there's a large error bar. So I mean, you, you shouldn't. I, I wouldn't necessarily be bothered by the the peaks are low mass, um, but but the fact that, for example, uh, I'll, I'll show you what to be bothered about in a second because it'll. <laughs> <laughs> this list looks pretty compared to what I'll show you later. Uh, <laughs> the colors, though, is that the statistical uncertainty, or I mean, it's just the statistical uncertainty. But then when you do the the best fit for, you've got systematic uncertainty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the systematic uncertainty and not all of it, but is built in. So the um, I'm just going to talk about the results first, and then tell you a little bit more about the details later. Um, I turn the Bayesian crank, and output comes a mass versus radius curve, and this is the curve. I've outlined the red and green are the six, one and two sigma regions, but basically it looks sort of like a line, and this is just to say to that. Within a good approximation, this analysis suggests that uh, all neutron stars in the universe have approximately the same radius. Um, and then we can construct the equation of state, uh, again, red and green in the same way. And just that there is a concordance, there is an agreement, even though these, these, this is a constraint in the equation of state from heavy ion collisions from quantum Monte Carlo and Kyle effective theory. None of these were inputs to the calculation, but we, t we agree with them on the, on the output side. Um, and so we get this particular range. Um, and in particular, one of the things that you'll note is there's this huge uncertainty here. And this is the possibility of a strong phase transition just above the saturation density, such as hyperons or quark matter. And so that's really an important uncertainty for us. Um, uh, and of course, there's the strong systematics. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is there's no, there's no assumption in this model that matter is correlated between low densities and high densities. I haven't necessarily assumed that matter inside the neutron star is made of neutrons and protons, because I just put polytropes there. Um, and so, or, or line segments, or I have several different models. And so that's, uh, that's an important thing that will come up later. So now I'm going to talk about, of course, the, the, the parameter space and the model space. So what I do for any particular model is I run through my Mon Markov Monte Carlo, which maybe meets hundreds of thousands of particular parameterizations. So I'm really trying to systematically explore the parameter space. And then in addition to this, I have maybe, um, this, is, this is four, later I'll have actually 36. So dozens of models which each of them have hundreds of thousands of parameterization. So I'm really looking at millions of different, millions of different realizations here um, to get. And you see, I, basically, the end result, 10.4 to 12.9, just comes from the smallest two sigma here and the largest two sigma here. And that's how we, how we selected that. But the, I'm really trying different um, equations of state models. Model A is the polytrope one I mentioned earlier. Model C happens to be the one with lines and there are some other, that gives the largest regime and then we, we did some other things to the data to try to get them basically understand as in a complete way as possible the systematic uncertainties. Um, so after we did this analysis of this of this data to get to get this mass versus radius curve, of course, more observations came online, and so uh, this is a, a result from uh, Gio, Sebastian Gio, Bob Rutledge, Natalie Webb, and so there's a fourth author there. In any case, um, and this is we sort of replotted their their fits, and so they do, they do a spectral fit to the data. And so you see that they get this one object, for example, omega sen, which is now 20 kilometer radius instead of 11 kilometer. And so this is a demonstration of how big these uncertainties, systematic uncertainties can be. In principle, they can be as large as a factor of two, and that's huge. And so, um, so Jim and I in particular looked at this observation, and one of the things we noticed immediately about it is that some of these stars are not consistent with any models of neutron stars that we expect from nu nuclear physics. If you think that nu neutron stars actually consist of neutrons and protons in nuclei in, in their outer regions, it's very difficult to understand um, this sort of observation. And so we decided to try to see if we could make these observations into a more, more coherent picture. And the way we were able to do this is to, to, to try different um, assumptions about the hydrogen column density. And this is a parameter which just characterizes how the X-ray photons are absorbed between the neutron star and when they're finally uh, detected in the satellite. Um, and so in particular, we suggested for this omega sen that the hydrogen column density is smaller um, and uh, then there's also this 
this neutron star, which is a very, which has a very small um, radius, and actually we also added the the possibility for for hydrogen or helium atmospheres, and that's that's how we got this this sort of new updated data with different hydrogen column densities, and so now it looks like there's a mass versus radius curve which can go through this. Yes, Prakash. Uh, no, no, not directly to me, but uh, I think, but Wynn will talk more about, and, and I'll talk about Wynn's paper with Craig Heinke, and, and it's my next slide, and they really, I think they really do the, the right thing, and they, they put the, they, they really do, they do it well. Yeah, that's a separate team. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard anything. I haven't. I haven't heard anything from from them. No. So I've talked to Gil about this, <coughs> and he's very willing to accept there are a variety of issues. So from from his standpoint and from Robert's, they more or less uh, took a shot at what they could do with their data and trying to lay out their assumptions, and they understand that some of those assumptions may not be right. So they're not seriously ready to the statements in their paper. I think I don't know necessarily about that. Gil is not. Uh, he, I mean. He, he's, he's the graduate student of study. So he's not hard necessarily. I can't speak necessarily for the others. Um. So let me, let me talk a little bit more about this because I think this will help. So basically Craig Heinke and Win Ho, and they, they, they reanalyzed in particular Omega Sen, which went to 20 kilometers. And one of the, there are two, th basically what happened to this, their analysis is that the radius for this particular object, which I've plotted here, comes back down to sort of uh, what we expect from nuclear physics. So the question is what happened? One is indeed they found smaller um, hydrogen column density values. Um, but, and if, so our prediction that the hydrogen column densities is, was smaller is correct, but our method of, of, of obtaining the hydrogen column density was not that great. Okay, and it turns out what Guillaume et al. were doing to determine the hydrogen column density, actually doing the spectral fit to the atmosphere, is really the right way. It's just that they, they didn't have this new data, and also they um, didn't have maybe uh, the, the best model of the, of the interstellar medium. So in order to understand how these X-ray photons go, you have to guess at what, whether it's hydrogen or helium or iron, you know, in between. And so those are the two big effects. And then for this, uh, for this other neutron star, uh, oops, going the other way. Um, yeah, this other one, it's, which is here in blue, the, the helium atmosphere made a, made a huge difference there. Um, and so in the end, because, because this radius sort of agrees with what we had earlier, then I don't think our, if I, if I now use this analysis in my Bayesian me method, it's not going to give me that much different results. Yes? So, so from a purely data analysis point of view, it seems like what you're doing is a slightly dangerous thing, right? You're, you take your, you know, some set of predictions, right, based on some you know, set of models, and then you look at the ones that don't seem to quite match, and those you try to reanalyze in, in great detail to see if there are other parameters that, that, you know, could be changed. But for instance, have you looked at the ones that are, you know, smack in the middle of the, the 10, 11 kilometer predictions and try to do the same thing on them, you know, That's look at the updated observations and see whether you could that's a perfectly valid criticism. It's exactly correct. So what we did is something very circular. We said, well, this observation doesn't match our nuclear physics, so then let's change it, and then we agree with the nuclear physics. <laughs> and so, yeah, it is, um, it is very dangerous. Um, we, ex we hope that, you know, in the future, basically, there will be more, more work, not only on these particular neutron stars, but also um, but also the other ones that happen to lie in the middle to continue to pin down some of these systematic uncertainties. I don't know if your team is currently working on the other three. Um, I think so. I don't <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, um, but this is a, a, a certainly something to be careful about in the future and to try to make sure we're, we're uh, understanding the systematics as carefully as possible. In any case, uh, to go on to talk about the connection to the nuclear physics, here, for example, this is our con the neutron star constraints on this quantity L. So we have four different models, and inside these four different models are hundreds of thousands 
or, uh, or more of neutron star parameterizations. And you see that we have very strong constraints in this parameter L compared to these are several different nuclear physics constraints. And so it turns out we're consistent with everything except this. And this um, is a result on um, a constraint on L from isobaric analog states by Pavel Danielovich and Jenny Lee. And they've actually redone this analysis and it now comes down. So I'm, I'm kind of happy about that. But then to summarize, not only this parameter L, uh, but also this, the amount of the symmetry, the magnitude of the symmetry energy S, and these are really two critical parameters in the nucleon-nuclear interaction, you see that this hatched region here is basically from neutron stars. And you see we're really sort of converging um, slowly on a region of this SL plane and sort of learning what these parameters are. Um, so, in, a, in the context of, of course, you, you also need the equation of state as an input to do a simulation, say, of a core collapse supernova or a neutron star, neutron star merger. And so what people have been doing is constructing so-called supernova equations of state. Okay, where you now have an equation of state that not only describes nuclear matter near the saturation density at zero temperature, but you try to describe a whole range of densities, a whole range of electron fractions matter outside um, weak equilibrium, and then a range of temperatures. Because in particular for merger simulations, this is important because you can reach temperatures as large as 100 MeV. Uh, and so uh, you would- I would like to ask some experts, including you on that question. Do you say 100 MeV? Is that over the whole core or uh, what? Using what times? Is the entire start up to 100 MeV? I mean, uh, I think the maximum temperatures are um, just below the saturation density, uh, you know, where, where you're, um, you're really pulling, where, you, where you're basically of high entropy because you're pulling matter off the surface. Uh, and I think then, then it, it's not all that different from, from sort of proto-neutral star evolution in the sense that you start out with something that's colder in the center and, and very high entropy outer layer, and then it's, and it cools down. I don't know. It would be great if we have, I don't know if we have the, peop the right people in the audience to give you a more detailed answer than that. Chris, or Francois. Right, yeah, I, I don't know, just want to start, um, that would just start. Oh, that's what you uh, did, yeah. Temperature. But last week, uh, Master Oshibata was describing a simulation and saying that in the shocked region, you got to about 50 MeV in the simulation, in the latest high resolution simulations. Uh, okay. So. Okay, so the, the shocked region is, I have, I have the merger app and there's, say it's a, was he using the same mass neutron star, or were they different? Uh, it was by equal mass. Oh, yeah. Chris should know better than me. What the hell? And roughly, what are the, when the temperature is about 100 MeV, what are the, let's say, the photon fractions? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in our but simulations, uh, the highest temperature is right when they come together, the two cores. And then it goes up to about 50 MeV or so. And it's fairly localized and small, and then it drops fairly rapidly. Yeah, time, I don't yeah, remember. The, yeah, the time, uh, uh, time duration when the temperature is very large. So <coughs> most probably a couple, a one millisecond or something. I don't remember for sure. I don't put that very high resolution movies of it, but um, that's where the high temperature occurs. Right, right when the two cores like collide. Yeah. Uh, another detailed question. Because I'm constructing the equation for state, I would like to know. Uh, does the does the collision take place asymptotically to be normal or? Uh, I have I have an odd up of a can see, I don't remember. Do you have your entropy profile as a function of time? No. I've looked at well, let's see. I'll I'll look and see. I have temperature but I don't know about entropy. Okay. So yeah, clearly I was wrong. There's lots of people in the audience. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, um, okay, but um, so one of the things you would, you would like to do, for example, is you would like to have an equation of state that you can use for these simulations that is in some sense um, 
has information from current neutron star mass and radius observations. And so these green and red regions, again, are um, results we got from neutron star radius constraints. And so um, you can ask whether or not, and there are some equations of state. This is the, the, the H. Shen et al. equation of state here on the outside, which are clearly quite far from what, we, what you might expect from neutron star radius constraints, given um, you know, modulo systematic uncertainties. Um, and then this is also, this is this SL plot. This is just a relabeling of S. And so this green region here is this constraint from nuclear masses. And so it turns out there are only, there are only some models which actually are inside this green region and not others. And so where I think a lot of the community is focused on um, precaution others generating new, new equations of state which respect these nuclear physics constraints and also the, the mass and radius observations. You know, and uh, obviously, um, this is only, you know, a handful of models. We, we cannot do this for, you know, millions of equations of state, but, I, but we'll have to figure out creative ways of maybe exploring the parameter and model space most efficiently. Um, so since we have information on neutron star structure, we can try to predict the things that LIGO would in principle measure. Um, and so I want to talk about tidal deformabilities. This is from Ben Lackey, who gave a talk two weeks ago. And so the idea is simply that neutron star, um, when they merge, for a long time they operate essentially as point masses. And then this, this point mass approximation doesn't, uh, doesn't fail until you get to, until the neutron stars are relatively close. And this is the gravitational wave signal as the neutron stars are approaching and then merger is somewhere over here. And so the, the actual structure of the neutron star appears in a lag of the, the phase of the gravitational wave signal. Um, and one way of parameterizing that lag is through this, the so-called tidal deformability. That is the, what is the, the, the deformation, the tidal deformation of a neutron star as a result of this presence of this other neutron star. And so it's often called lambda here. And so it actually turns out that it's, it's monotonically related to radius in most cases, so that a larger radius means larger tidal deformability, a larger neutron star is easier to squish around, and so it's e also easier to detect in LIGO. Um, and so this is a manifestation of that exact concept, um, a calculation by Tanya Hinderer. And so you see the advanced LIGO region here, and so that it's, it's e um, it's, you can, in advanced LIGO, this prediction suggested you could detect tidal deformabilities above this line. So if you go below this line, then the tidal deformation is smaller, it's harder to, to detect. Um, and so, um, that's the same thing as the love number, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the love number, thank you. And how far away were the, what kind of signal was she assuming? Um, I, uh, I can't quite remember. Uh, exactly what the um, what what is the details of this? Because what it is saying is, at once LIGO can see up to a certain point. That yeah. Flying and then they like yeah, but there's some assumption that, that this is there has to be an assumption here that this merger happened at some distance, you know, at 20 megaparsecs or whatever. And uh, we're talking about 100 megaparsecs. 100 megaparsecs. Yeah. Exactly the time. And only when, when, you add, when you add the close to merger, right? Like yeah. So, and in fact, actually, there are there are several works here which have updated this 2010 work, which I will talk about here. And so, uh, I just want to point out that here in the solid and and dotted lines are sort of the predictions that, if from you, if you like, from the neutron star mass and radius observations of the tidal deformability and its probability distribution. So here I have four particular models which I used for this calculation. And, uh, and again, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of neutron star realizations here. And you see that there is indeed some systematic uncertainty here, but no matter what model you choose, basically it suggests that it's be it typically between about um, a little less than one and three times 10 to the, now this is the tidal deformability lambda again. Um, this is the neutron star moment of inertia um, for, a, and these are both for a 1.4 solar and mass neutron star. So, um, and this is just to update our discussion. There are several different recent works which talk more carefully about LIGO sensitivity. So for example, multiple measurements, not just one measurement, but several neutron star mergers can help you. And then Ben Lackey, of course, a couple of weeks ago talked about directly parameterizing the equation of state and how that might additionally help you uh, detect idle deformabilities. And so, and then what you mentioned about um, detecting the source beyond this 400 hertz, um, the higher, the closer, the, the closer to merger that you have gravitational wave signal, the more information you get in principle about tidal deformability. When we wrote our paper, Ben from PSU was very 
not very sanguine that low numbers could be measured. Has the situation changed? I think, I th I think it's, getting, it's getting better. Um, yeah, that's Paul, could you go back to the last slide? Yes. And the figure that, I mean, for advanced LIGO, you've got masses that are less than one for it, for it to be detectable, right? That's right. And this is only no, 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 this is a, this is only for one. If you add in the, the revision, the stuff that's coming from that slide, how does that? The first one, the first paper there, yeah. says that if you observe something like 25 events in advanced type of design sensitivity, you will be able to distinguish between the extreme equations of state. I think they took three different models, extreme models. Yeah. And they could you know, distinguish. But I think the. If you go back a slide, uh, the other thing from what Hinderer said. So they use 400 hertz as just kind of the round number of margin for how high they can go and feel confident about their waveforms. What they argued, though, is that, if you can go back. Yeah, yeah sorry. So uh, in that figure, mm -hmm. so the uncertainty, so basically what you have on the vertical axis, yeah. uh, scales like nu max to the minus 2.2, where nu max is the highest frequency that you can trust your waveforms. Right. So if you could actually get to 1,500 hertz mm -hmm. or something with confidence, which is still way away. If you can do that, then you might have real prospects of mm -hmm. an individual strong event, 100 microparsecs takes on, of having a decent constraint. So, if you see this picture for a while, if you notice, in our quick paper, we have a slightly more telling picture, but this is this video. For some reason that I was never able to you know, put my hand on, the maximum for all these occurs around one ish solar masses. Yes. Okay. So you go to 1.4 hertz masses as stars, the love number itself in magnitude decreases. So I was a little <laughs> disappointed that yeah. conspiracy, uh. <laughs> conspiracy went into it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, just, I just remember this now. Yeah. I don't. I have computed these curves, but I uh, similar curves, but I don't have a good explanation for that for that particular effect. Um, and w most importantly, of course, this the neutron star radius measurements, as, we, as we've mentioned, have very strong systematic uncertainties. And one of the exciting things about LIGO is that for a large enough signal to noise, I think LIGO may have smaller systematics. And so even if even if LIGO's on um, their statistical uncertainty was larger than this it would also be, it would still be a strong benefit to the community because of the potential for smaller systematic uncertainties. <laughs> so, so that's something to keep in mind. Remember, it goes like R to the pi, just the radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wh you, you, you really get a benefit if you can detect it within some percentage. Um, so I want to talk briefly um, for, there's, I know there are several people here interested in the neutron star crust. Um, so this is a picture I stole from Nick Chamel, I think maybe his Living Reviews article. Uh, and so this is just a, a sort of schematic of the nuclear uh, neutron star crust. The nuclei become more and more neutron rich and closer together. And this is the so-called nuclear pasta phase. And then you transition to sort of nuclear matter near this density about three times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed. And so uh, if you like a cross section of the crust, I like this picture because it's, it's older than I am. This is a really two to force calculation of tin 1800. Uh, and then Wigner site cells inside the neutron star crust. And so these, there's presumably 50 protons here and then and many, many neutrons. You have to imagine this is a big three-dimensional volume. And so these are very exotic and exciting nuclei, which will ne they'll never measure this in the lab, at least not, not anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so why this is relevant is because we, we'd like to make connections between, you know, between all sorts of different kinds of observations um, and um, so we'd like to know, for example, about pulsar glitches. There's a lot of observational data. We'd like to be able to use that data. So what does this data say? The data says that neutron stars spin down. Um, their their uh, rotation rate decreases with time. And every once in a while, there's a glitch. It spins up very quickly, and then the rotational equilibrium is restored. So the basic idea of what's happening in this glitch is that most of the star is, is rotating as a solid body, there, but there's a region of the star which is uh, weakly coupled, and it's, you can think of this as a superfluid region. And so it's weakly coupled to the ro rotation, and for some, one reason or the other, um, the superfluid catches up with the rest of the neutron star, and then finally, uh, and then finally it recovers. 
<clears throat> and so why does the superfluid catch up? Well, the idea is that you, if you have superfluid vortices that are pinned to the lattice, that um, as the neutron star spins down, these vortices are pulled outwards, but they're pinned to the lattice site, so, those, so they really can't move. They, they sort of bow out, and then eventually they sort of skip, and they jump lattice sites. And so this is one, uh, one sort of loose description of a, of a model for, for those pulsar glitches. Um, in order for this to work, you must have enough superfluid matter, enough superfluid neutrons, and it's natural to identify these with these, um, these, these neutrons here, which are not locked inside nuclei, which are sort of quasi-free. So are there enough neutrons outside here to really explain pulsar glitches? And one of the problems is this idea of entrainment, again, um, computed by Nicolas Chamel. The idea is that um, as these nuclei, which are fixed in the lattice, are moving around the neutron star, these, um, because there's, there's a strong force between these neutrons here and these nucleons in here, these neutrons are sort of dragged along with the rotation of the neutrino star. And this dragging is referred to as entrainment. And what um, current calculations suggest is that basically um, 70 to 80, 75 to 85% of these neutrons are sort of dragged along with the lattice. So many of these neutrons are not really free and superfluid as you expect. And so then the question is, is how much do we have enough superfluidity? Um, and so we require at least 1.6% of the total moment of inertia of the star to lie within these superfluid neutrons. And so you can compute the moment of inertia directly then either from the, the tidal deformability or from assuming some mass and radius observations. And you can ask what is the fraction of moment of inertia that's, that's inside these superfluid neutrons. And here's the fraction. And this doesn't include entrainment. So basically, whatever entrainment you see, you have to divide at least by a factor of four. And so you see, maybe we can get as much as, maybe if you're very, very finely tuned, maybe a, a, as much as 0.5% of 5% of the fraction of the moment of inertia in the crust. But then you have to divide that by four. And that's already smaller than this 1.6%. And so this is just to point out that current mass and radius observations say that this sort of naive picture of of the, the, the superfluid neutrons in the crust are the responsible for pulsar glitches is there's something wrong with this picture. Um, and so either it's systematic uncertainties in the mass and radius observations, or there's more superfluid um, somewhere in the core, or there's several other solutions. Um, Niels Anderson and, and Win Ho is also part of this work, so they have also a set of possible solutions in their paper. So. Uh, um, so actually this, so if you have these models, these dashed lines here um, are, they're, they're totally fine. And so this is, these are things like, uh, these are things like 13, 14 kilometer radii. So not that much. This is somewhat surprising because, you know, you don't buy from the crustal region, you look at the structure of the star, the mass. In the crustal region, you don't buy much to the radius. The radius right. That's right, that's right. So, so how does that square with the idea that you need to? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the, it's the thickness of the crust. So the thickness, even though the, lo the, the I, I guess the naive way I would think about it is that the, the radius of the neutron star doesn't change a lot, but the thickness of the crust can ch change quite significantly. So even for a fixed radius, your crust thickness can change by 40% depending on what your nuclear physics model is. And that's for a fixed, so that's for a fixed mass and radius. You can sort of change the size of the crust. But how much does the physics has to be changed? Yeah, yeah, so that's by changing the symmetry energy. That's how you get away with that. This, well, this, the symmetry energy is relevant for the entire inner crust, but which is most of the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, so then uh, with they, there was a discussion about the connection to, uh, to, the, to the neutron drip line. So the idea is there's, there's, a, there's a paper which um, uses a particular kind. This is basically skirm interactions and sort of looks at neutron star, neutron star radii and then also a related calculation computing the neutron drip line, the, the most, if you like, the most uh, neutron rich stable uh, isotope of this is happens to be erbium an interesting choice so the uh, so you see that you can 
you know, because there's, there's this uncertainty in the, reaction, in the interaction, but if you measure a neutron star radius, the idea was maybe you could constrain the neutron drip line. And so that was something mentioned and my, my only, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to point out, but this is basically, the, the only issue with this is it's unfortunately only a handful of models, only a handful actually of parameterizations from one particular model, this skirm model. And so, and they've, in order to do, to make this association, they have to assume that matter in the center of the neutron star happens to consist exactly of neutrons and protons, which are described by the same skirm interaction they used near the saturation density. And so I think this connection has not been fully explored, but it's certainly an interesting thing to try to do because these, of course, these very, very neutron rich nuclei are exactly the nuclei which might be created in the R process. And so it's worth trying to connect, of course, if um, neutron star mergers are indeed the side of the R process, it's natural to want to do this kind of physics. And so I think it's worth looking into this. We want to put as much of this nuclear physics in all of our models so we can understand how these observations might, might tell us more nuclear physics. Can you again? Yeah. Tell me what the problem is. What is the problem? Uh, is, there a, is there a difficulty or a... So the, the claim, the, the question was, I don't know is the problem is the question. The question is, is could you use neutron star radius measurements to constrain the drip line? Oh, okay. It's a question. Anymore. Yeah. I think the claim that Sandio made, which I think is not brought up by the papers, at least not as I could find it when you were driving it by the Oh, okay. So sitting in the back of the wobbly one. Well, trying to make so my, my sympathies. The claim that Sandio made was that if you had a radius measurement better than, say, half a kilometer, then you would be doing better at constraining the drip line, etc. than you would be the upcoming um, nuclear physics experiments. That was his claim. And then he su he's suggested these two papers. Right, right. But I couldn't find that statement in these two papers. Oh, no, certainly, yeah, these, these two papers are, yeah, don't, don't. I mean, this is sort of, you have to make the connection already between these two papers, and Sanjay has already done this. And, um, so one, actually, one of the things, if you like, neutron star radii are principally a constraint in L, um, but not S. And this is really a function most tightly of the symmetry energy S. And so the only way to make that connection is through some sort of okay. correlation. Um, anyway. Wait, wait, wait. Neutron nuclei depends on properties of neutron nuclei. Yes. Right. And their surface properties and their yes. and it's a whole Oh, yes. And in fact, a whole, whole new thing. I mean, uh, that's, that's right. Shell effects, uh, you'll notice that this is exactly mid-shell. And so if they had done this out here, where the neutron drip line happens to lie at, at the magic shell, and this happens for gold because it goes to 184 instead of 160. Yeah. So yeah, this is... This is an important point and some, so um, in any case, that's, that's basically all I wanted to say, uh, at least for today. The, uh, I, I think current neutron star mass and radius <coughs> observations, again, modulo serious systematic uncertainties that are worth talking about, suggest that neutron star radii lie between 10 and 13 kilometers. And we now are learning something about the equation of state. Some of these are, are ruled out uh, at some level. Um, we, we now know something about the, the moment of inertia of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star and also the tidal deformability. Um, and we've learned something about the nucleon nuclear interaction. We've learned, for example, that this parameter L is constrained very tightly to be between, this is the, in parentheses, of the two sigma and the others, the one sigma constraints. Um, and then, of course, the, I, I mentioned briefly this quandary um, about whether or not there's a mo moment of inertia to explain glitches, but I, um, I'm really excited. Not only LIGO, but also there are other uh, neutron star measurements coming online, Athena and NICER, um, Astro H, uh, maybe LOFT in the future, uh, all sorts of things which, which may provide new mass and radius constraints and um, new information. So I'm um, excited for the future. Thank you. Very good. Plenty of time. What experimental observation tells you not inferences of mass and radii, but what experimental observation allows you to put a bound on moment of inertia? Um, 
there is any so to s because because moment of inertia is connected to radius, especially for a fixed mass, and radius is connected to L. Then, in principle, anything which measures L will will tell you something about the moment of inertia. For example, um, I just thank you for because <laughs> this is the <laughs> <laughs> this is the neutrons. You can't show me graphs that I made you plot. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you measure the neutron skin thickness of lead, this this will work. Um, this gives you, in principle, a constraint on L. Um, that's the best way to do it that I can think of. No, I meant astrophysical. Oh, astrophysical. Oh, um, oh. So anytime. Anything like a radius measurement, or, or if you, um, if let's we, see. If we observe continuous waves from gravitation, gravitation wave. So oh, that might. Well, you can constrain the moment of inertia and electricity. Yeah. Plane. Yeah. I don't know how much it's going to constrain. First of all, we ought to be lucky to the observe. The one that I knew was that you know if you have a double pulsar system. Yes. Yeah, so the paper I'm thinking of is there's one by Kramer in 2006 that talks about this double pulsar. Jim and Schultz? Jim or, or Bennett Link, maybe, too. Yeah, that, and the Moore had some, had made some uh, yeah. observations about this. So that's, you know, in principle. Yeah. That's the best. Mm -hmm. The rest are sort of connecting things, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Radius, mode of inertia, dimensionally has to be a mass squared, blah, blah, blah. Yep. But it's not a, you know, yeah. pristine, observational, not direct. Yeah. yeah, if you can do it directly, then that, that's, that would be awesome. So the other hope you would have, and, and this is pretty much pie in the sky, but if you're able to get iron K alkalines. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Lines, lines, lines would be <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I don't mean lines from the surface of the star. Yeah. I mean from the disk. Right. So the, the, the hope, and believe me, I don't think this is realistic, is that because the innermost stable circuit orbit depends on the yeah. angular momentum of the star. Yeah, so yeah. So knowing the spin frequency, knowing the mass, and somehow managing to get a precise measurement of the, the spin parameter would give you a measurement of the moment of inertia as well. And, and you're assuming that you're measuring the spin frequency because you're seeing this as a radio pulse, or how, how do you know that? I mean, I understand how you measure the angular momentum. Oh, so the QPO. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So something like that. However, uh, yes, it, the spin frequency is the least of your worries in this particular measurement. Uh, yeah. Theoretical possibility. Yeah. I mean, in principle, well, if you can model, if you understand the course, it's with the pulse Yeah. Oh. observations from pulsars, yeah, that it's possible to get the mass of radii. That's, do you know if that is? From an isolated radio yeah, pulsar? Yeah, from, from that has brought this to now? That's news to me. Well, I'm giving a prize to people who can tell you the mass of radius. I, 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 <laughs> I don't think I want the mass and the radius. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Nicer will be, so this is neutron star interior composition explorer, or, right? You gotta have that extra <laughs> Explorer. That's okay, LIGO might appropriate be like, whoa, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so not, not from radio observations, but uh, look, looking at a, so JL437 is a non accreting radio pulsar that has x rays coming from it. 